to answer well, but that's okay. So here is the question. Uh, what are the current bills in Texas and Florida about LGBTQ rights actually saying and doing? Every news source I've read says something entirely different, and I'm not sure who to trust. Well, we're going to go and actually read the things. Um, one thing to note, in Florida, it's bill slash law. In Texas, we're looking at, an, from what I can tell, we're looking at an attorney general opinion which is basically then instructions to the prosecutors throughout Texas. So, a little different. We'll talk about that when we get to there. We're actually going to start, though, with the Florida law, which is only seven pages long. I believe I have the most recent uh, edited version, because, you know, laws go through multiple versions. But, um, hopefully, if it isn't the most recent, it's close enough to the most recent that it will uh, thing. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna read it. We're just gonna sit here together. Now let's see, let's make this big for you. Eh, too big. There we go. Okay, we're gonna read it together. We're gonna try to figure out what exactly is going on here. <clears throat> okay, an act relating to parental rights and education, amending some other law requiring district school boards to adopt procedures that comport with certain provisions of law for notifying a student's parents of specified information, requiring such procedures to reinforce the fundamental right of parents to make decisions regarding the upbringing and control of their children in a specified manner, prohibiting the procedures from prohibiting a parent from accessing certain records, providing construction prohibiting a school district from adopting procedures or student support forms that prohibit school district personnel from notifying a parent about specified information or that encourage or have the effect of encouraging a student to withhold information withhold from a parent such information wow this is a heck of a sentence all right you know what we're going to roll back to the top we're going to go through each one of these semicolon bits and figure out what they mean okay requiring district school boards to adopt procedures that comport with certain provisions of law for notifying a student's parents of specified information. So school boards and schools, therefore, can't circumvent state law that a school has to notify a parent about specific information. Doesn't say what the specified information is here yet. Okay. And require such procedures to reinforce the fundamental right of parents to make decisions regarding the upbringing and control of their children in a specified manner. Um, basically, uh, okay, so that, that to me is saying parents get to choose how they raise their kids, the schools don't get to, which is a national fight that's been going on for probably four or five years now, um, but has poked its head up more since COVID times because parents were actually seeing what was happening with the school instruction and a lot of them had feelings about it. And yeah, so, um, So it's the fundamental right of the parents to make decisions regarding the upbringing and control of their children in a specified manner. Very vague as to what this exactly means, but we have the general notion. Prohibiting the procedures from prohibiting the procedures from prohibiting parent a parent from accessing certain records. Okay, yeah. School board can't say this is confidential from a parent, which makes sense. Providing construction, I have no idea what we're talking about here. Prohibiting a school district from adopting procedures or student support forms that prohibit school district personnel from notifying a parent about specified information or that encourage or have the effect of encouraging a student to withhold from a parent such information. Okay, you can't, you, you can neither set it up such that school people aren't allowed to tell parents facts about their children 
and you're not allowed to encourage students to keep secrets from their parents. Prohibiting school... Now, obviously, at some point, we have to get into what the hubbub is about, but thus far, this is... In, until we get... If specific information is to mean that you're not allowed to pick a subset of information to hold secret, nothing here is very, like, shocking. Prohibit school district personnel from discouraging or prohibiting parental notification and involvement in critical decisions affecting a student's mental, emotional, or physical well-being. Okay. Yeah. So, it's basically the same thing again, just we're, we're laying it out very explicit. You can't withhold information about a student from their parents. You can't encourage it. You can't prohibit it. Or you can't encourage withholding, and you can't withhold. Providing construction. Again, don't know what that means yet. Okay. Prohibiting classroom discussion. Here we go. About sexual orientation or gender identity in certain grade levels or in a specified manner. We'll have to get down to that. This is what... This is what we are... All the contentions about is right here. But... Specified manner... And certain grade levels. We have to find out what those mean before we make judgments on what this whole clause is saying. Requiring... Certain trainings, certain training developed or provided by a school district to adhere to standards established by the Department of Education. Okay, so school district training has to adhere to state, you know, qualifications. Holy crap, how long is this sentence? We're on page two. Requiring school districts to notify parents of health care services and provide parents the opportunity to consent or decline to such services. Yeah, I mean, regardless of what you, your personal feelings on this, that's the general law. If you're not an emancipated minor, your parents have the right to be the one to consent or refuse certain procedures. That's just the law. And school districts sometimes like to think that they can circumvent state or federal laws but they can't providing that a specified a specified parental consent does not waive certain parental rights okay parental consent to one thing doesn't waive parental rights on other things requiring school districts to provide parents with certain questionnaires or health screening forms and obtain parental position a permission sorry before administering such questionnaires and forms. Okay, so before the school can start questioning your kids about their health, you have to have the parent's consent. Makes sense. Requiring school districts to adopt certain procedures for resolving specified parental concerns. That's super meaningless without context. Requiring resolution within a specified time frame. All right, well, so long as the time frame is reasonable, it's always good to make a time frame for things to have to get resolved in, because otherwise things get pushed forever. Requiring the Commissioner of Education to appoint a special magistrate for unresolved concerns. That's good. If there's concerns that are failing to meet the time frame, you tried to set up a time frame, you need to have a fallback position that takes it out of the hands of whoever wasn't getting it done in the time frame. That makes sense. Providing requirements for the special magistrate. Makes sense. Requiring the State Board of Education to approve or reject the special magistrate's recommendation within a specified time frame. Okay, so we have the special magistrate, but we have oversight, and the oversight then also has a time frame. Okay. Requiring school districts to bear the cost of the special magistrate while well, they failed to resolve the concerns the first time around, so they have to pay for it, okay? That's the, the stick, you know, make encouraging them to actually do the resolution and not dig their heels in. 
requiring the State Board of Education to adopt rules, providing requirements for such rules. Um, that doesn't mean a lot without knowing what we're talking about, specifically. Authorizing a parent to bring an action against a school district to obtain a uh, declaratory judgment that a school district procedure or practice violates certain provisions of law. Okay, so that's specifically saying if parents find that a school district is flouting state law, um, especially like this, flouting this state law, parents are able to go to a judge and say, yo, judge, they're breaking the law. Um, otherwise, and, and you need this, you need a clause like that in there to establish that parents have standing. Um, that it doesn't have to be like a state official suing the school district because then you'd have to have a state official looking at all the school districts in a state to make sure that they're all applying to the law. Parents are actually paying attention. Some parents are paying attention to their home. All right, to their home district. Providing for additional award of injunctive relief damages reasonable attorney fees and court costs to certain parents. That means if you sue and you win, you can sue for money, sue for damages, excuse me, requiring school districts to adopt certain policies to notify parents of certain rights. Okay. School districts have to tell the parents that they have the right to do these things. Kind of like how, when you go to a doctor's office, there's a, like a lot of times you have to sign a patient bill of rights informing you, you have these rights. Makes sense. Providing construction. Requiring the department to review and update, as necessary, specified materials by a certain date. Providing an effective date. Okay. That, you know, that, that's pretty clear. All right, now we're going to get into the actual guts, I think. Which only has like three and a half pages to get through, so it can't be that complicated. All right. Section 1, paragraph C, is added to that law to read Powers and duties of district school board. The district school board, acting as a board, shall exercise and perform all the duties listed below. Okay. In accordance with the rights of parents enumerated elsewhere, adopt procedures for notifying a parent if there is a change in the student's services or monitoring related to the student's mental, emotional, or physical health or well-being and the school's ability to provide a safe and supportive learning environment for the student. Okay. Par schools have to tell parents if they think there's something going on with the student's mental, emotional, or physical health. Now, you might say, what if the risk is the parents? Well, that would fall entirely differently. They wouldn't notify the parents. They'd notify child services. So there's a whole different mechanism for that. But this is saying if there's something else that's they're not calling child services about, you can't keep it secret from the parents. The procedures must reinforce the fundamental right of parents to make decisions regarding the upbringing and control of their children by requiring school district personnel to encourage a student to discuss issues relating to his or her well-being with his or her parents or to facilitate facilitate discussion of the issue with the parent. All right. So they're able to encourage students to talk to the parents or facilitate. So, you know, call the parent in, talk, be the, the medium through which a discussion happens. So they have some flexibility there. The procedures may not prohibit parents from accessing any of their students' education or health records created, maintained, or used by the school district. That makes sense. Parents have the right to access their child's records, like official records. It's just how it is. All right. A school district may not adopt procedures or student support forms that prohibit school district personnel from notifying a parent about his or her student's mental, emotional, or physical health or well-being, or a change in related services or monitoring, or encourage or have the effect of encouraging the student to withhold information, or from, withhold from a parent such information. 
School district personnel may not discourage or prohibit parental notification of and involvement in critical decisions affecting a student's mental, emotional, or physical health or well-being. This subparagraph does not prohibit school district from adopting procedures that permit school personnel to withhold such information from a parent if a reasonably prudent person would believe that disclosure would result in abuse, abandonment, or, or neglect as those terms are defined. Okay. If you think the person's going to beat their kid over this, if you think the person is the cause of the strife, you don't have to tell the parent. Otherwise, if you don't think the parent is going to cause harm or is the root of harm, you can't withhold from the parent. You can't encourage it to get around the, pro the prohibiting. You can't encourage the student to do it on their own. You just can't withhold that from the parent unless you, a reasonably prudent person, would believe that disclosure would result in abuse, abandonment, or neglect as those terms are defined. Now, the reason it says reasonably prudent person, that's standard legalese for if you go to a court and, like, you basically, you can't just say in all cases, oh, it could lead to abuse or abandonment or neglect. You know, you need to have evidence. You would need to be able to make a case if you had to make a case. All right. Okay, here we go. Excuse me. Classroom instruction by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity may not occur in kindergarten through grade three or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. All right, here's, here's the whole root of the don't say gay. From kindergarten to grade three, we're not doing sexual orientation or gender identity. Sexual orientation would inherently, like, I don't know how you would discuss sexual orientation without doing sex ed for eight-year-olds or five-year-olds. Now, there's a there's all the great debates about when, how much sex ed, where, when, how much, you know, how detailed. But this is only for eight, for five to eight-year-olds. Um... And then past that, or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students in accordance with state standards. So just because they're in grade four doesn't mean you can start showing them hardcore <laughs> pornographic material. Um, okay, but, it, but it's very explicit that you can do it. It just needs to be appropriate for the grade level. That makes sense. And nowhere in here, it's classroom instruction. It's not, oh, I have a boyfriend because I'm gay. Your teacher's saying that. It's not, I don't see anything in here about prohibiting discussion, but it, need, it can't be a classroom instruction. Now, where those lines are drawn, yeah, that could get, that could get sticky, it could get hairy, but that is not the blanket ban that I have seen claimed. All right, page five already. Student support services training developed or provided, student support services training developed or provided by a school district to school district personnel must adhere to student service guidelines, standards, and frameworks established by the Department of Education. That makes sense. At the beginning of the school year, each school district shall notify parents of each health care service offered at their student's school and the option to withhold consent or decline any specific service. Parental consent to a health care service does not waive the parent's right to access his or her student's educational or health records or to be notified about a change in his or her student's services or monitoring as provided by this paragraph. Um... Yeah, once again, that makes sense. Um, like, 
You might not like the idea that a parent has the right to control a child's medical situation, but I mean, that that is as it is. Uh, the legal control over a child goes to the parents, not to the state. That's how it always has been in this country. And that's probably how it's going to be for dang near forever. Um, and that's just basically stating that, yeah, we're not breaking federal law. It's a shame how much state law has to be. We're not breaking federal law. Anyway. Before administering a student well-being questionnaire or health screening form to a student in kindergarten through third grade, the school district must provide the questionnaire or health screening form to the parent and obtain permission. Okay, so specifically, five to eight-year-olds, you have to let the parents know what you're asking them for well-being and health screening. I really don't see much of a problem in that. Each school district shall adopt procedures for a parent to notify the principal or his or her designate, designee regarding concerns under this paragraph at his or, her, his or her student's school and the process for resolving those concerns within seven calendar days after notification of the parent. All right, so you have to, you have to, let's see, regarding concerns at his or her student and process for resolving. Okay, so you have to be able to, you have a week. If there's concerns, you have a week to start getting cracking. Uh, I don't, I don't know if this says it has to be resolved in seven days or it has to be making progress in seven days, but a lawyer would be able to tell you. Um, oh, here we go. At a minimum, the procedures must require within 30 days after notification by the parent that the concern remains unresolved, the school district must either resolve the concern or provide a statement of the reasons for not resolving the concern. Okay, you have 30 days. They have a month to resolve a concern about the school district breaking this law, which seems very generous. If a concern is not resolved by the school district, a parent may request a uh, request the commissioner of education to appoint a special magistrate who is a member of the Florida Bar in good standing who has at least five years experience in administrative law. The special mag pardon me. The special magistrate shall determine facts relating to the dispute over the school district procedure or practice, consider information provided by the school district, and render a recommended decision for resolution to the State Board of Education within 30 days. Uh, the Board of Education must approve or reject the recommended decision at its next regularly scheduled meeting that is more than seven calendar days and no more 30 days after the date that the decision is recommended decision is transmitted. The cost of the special magistrate shall be borne by the school district. The state education shall adopt rules including forms necessary to implement this subparagraph. The other option is Bring an action against the school district to obtain a declaratory judgment that the school district procedure or practice violates this paragraph and seek injunctive relief. A court may award damages and shall award reasonable attorney fees and court costs to a parent who receives declaratory or uh, declar declaratory, man, my words are tripping up, or injunctive relief. Okay, so you can sue. And, you know, thing. Each school district shall adopt policies to notify parents of the procedures required under this paragraph. Makes sense. Nothing contained in this subparagraph shall be construed to abridge or alter the rights of action or remedies in equity already existing under common or common law or general law. So basically, this it, this isn't superseding other reasons you could sue the school district. Um, this is just adding a specific new one. Again, you have to put that in there for lawyer speak because otherwise, you know, if there was abuse at a school, say, um, then like some lawyer might say, oh no, under this, this is how we have to, you know, sue now and I'm saying, no, this only applies to this. The other stuff still all applies. 
by June 30th, 2023, the Department of Education shall review and update, as necessary, school counseling framework and frameworks and standards, educator practices, and professional conduct principles, and any other student services, personnel, guidelines, standards, student services, personnel, guidelines. That's a lot of words at once. Standards or frameworks in accordance with the requirements of this act. Okay, so we're going to set up everything that we have here. You have a year to do it. And this act shall take effect July 1st, 2022. Okay, we have now read the bill. We have read the text. Uh, I have, to the best of my ability, tried to simplify where legalese is concerned and accentuate exactly the issue regions um, of, of this. Uh, I'm not going to pass judgment on it. That's not what I was asked to do. I was asked to say what these actually say. You have to make your own decisions. Is this a reasonable law? Are parts of it reasonable? Are parts of it not reasonable? What parts are not reasonable and why? What parts are reasonable and why? You have to make these decisions on your own with the information that you can get. Okay, so that was the Florida law. Now, the Texas Attorney General opinion. Let's make this bigger. <coughs> mm, swallowed down the wrong pipe. So, from what I can tell, this, um, let me just fix my throat. <coughs> mm. From what I can tell, this is the central document in the Texas affair. Now, it's kind of like an executive order in that it has legal standing and power, but is does not have the permanence of a law. Ken Paxton could tomorrow say, you know what, I don't think I agree with this, and it gets thrown out. It could end up in court, and a judge could say, this doesn't agree with this law or that law, it gets thrown out. Very, very quickly and easily. A lot easier than overturning a law. So, um... But, at the same time, it does provide guidance for all of the state prosecutors. Basically, anyone under the Attorney General's office. People who are investigating or prosecuting under the umbrella of the state Attorney General. This is providing guidance for. So, let's see what is in here. I imagine this is going to be possibly harder to read. But it's only 13 pages, so let's do it. <coughs> All right, so this is as written as a letter to the chair of the House Committee on General Investigating in the Texas House of Representatives about whether certain medical procedures performed on children can, can constitute child abuse. Dear Representative Krauss, you ask whether the performance of certain medical and chemical procedures on children, several of which have the effect of sterilization, constitute child abuse. You specifically ask about procedures falling under the broader category of gender reassignment surgeries. Request letter at one. You state that such procedures are, generally, are typically performed to transition individuals with gender dysphoria to their desired genders, and you identify the following sex change procedures. Just get another sip because it's still tickling in the back of my throat. <clears throat> Sterilization through castration, vasectomy, hysterectomy, oophorectomy, medioplasty, erectectomy, penectomy, phalloplasty, and vaginoplasty. Mesectomies and removing from children otherwise healthy or non-diseased body part or tissue. Uh, at footnote one admitted. Okay, additionally you ask whether 
providing, administering, prescribing, or dispensing drugs to children that induce transient or permanent infertility constitutes child abuse. You include the following categories of drugs. Puberty suppressants or puberty blocking drugs. Super phallosogic doses of testosterone to females and super physiologic doses of estrogen to males. You qualify your question with the following statement. Some children have a medically vi verifiable gender disorder of sex development or do not have the normal sex chromosome structure for male or female, as determined by a physician through genetic testing that require procedures similar to those described in these requests. In other words, in rare circumstances, some of the procedures you list here are born out of medical necessity. For example, a ma minor male with testicular cancer may need an orectomy. Okay, so that's removing a testicle then. This opinion does not address or apply to medically necessary procedures. Okay. Um, I, I actually might do a little editorializing on this one for some broader global context because while this debate is raging in the United States, a similar but very different debate is raging in other parts of um, the developed world, most specifically in Western and Northern Europe. And uh, I think it would prov it just would be interesting to you, the viewer, to hear what's going on there and kind of compare and contrast what's going on in our two different regions um, about the same types of issues. Okay. Based on the analysis herein, each of the sex change procedures and treatments enumerated above when performed, on, when performed on children can legally constitute child abuse under several provisions of the Texas Family Code. These procedures and treatments can cause mental or emotional injury to a child that results in an observable and material impairment in a child's growth, development, or psychological functioning. Oh, we should point out here importantly. I do not know, under Texas Family Code, if child is a legal word that delineates a specific age range or if it's just anyone under the age of 18. I don't know. It could be either one. Uh, I imagine it's probably anyone under the age of 18, but not being a Texas lawyer, I couldn't tell you if Texas did something different because states do that sometimes. All right. These procedures and treatments can cause or permit the child to be in a situation in which the child sustains a mental or emotional injury that results in observable and material impairment of the, in the child's growth, development, or psychological functioning. These procedures and treatments can cause a physical injury that results in substantial harm to the child. And these procedures and treatments often involve a failure to make a reasonable effort to prevent an action by another person that results in physical injury that results in substantial harm to a child, particularly by parents, counselors, and physicians. In addition to the analysis under Family Code, we discuss below the fundamental right to procreation, issues of physical and emotional harm associated with these procedures and treatments consent laws in Texas and throughout the country, and existing child abuse standards. Each of these procedures and treatments you ask about can, can, can constitute child abuse when performed on minor children. Okay, so minor children makes me think that we are talking about anyone under the age of 18. The fundamental right to procreation is not what I was expecting to read there. All right. Nature and context of the question presented. Forming the basis for your request, you contend that the sex change procedures and treatments you are asking about are typically performed to transition individuals with gender dysphoria to their desired genders. The novel trend of providing these elective sex change to minors ha often has the effect of permanently sterilizing these minor children. All right, so yes, because that's how our surgeries work currently. Or not treatments work currently novel doesn't mean like uh how do i put this novel just meaning recent it's it's a novel trend it's a recent trend 
While you refer to these procedures as sex changes, it is important to note that it remains medically impossible to truly change the sex of an individual because this is determined biologically at conception. No doctor can can replace a fully functional male sex organ with a fully functioning female sex organ or vice versa. In reality, these sex change procedures seek to destroy a fully functioning sex organ, sex organ in order to cosmetically create the illusion of a sex change. That is correct. Um, because under current nomenclature, gender is, is you know, mutable, but sex is not mutable under our current abilities of science. We just can't do it. All right. Beyond the obvious harm of permanently sterilizing a child, these procedures and treatments can cause side effects and harms beyond permanent infertility, including serious mental health effects, venous thrombosis, thromboembolism, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, weight gain, decreased libido. It's a little less important, I think, than some of these other ones. Uh, hypertriglycid hypertriglyceridemia, elevated blood pressure, decreased glucose tolerance, gallbladder disease, benign pituitary prolactinoma, lowered and elevated triglycerides, increased hormo er, homo homocysteine levels, heptatotoxicity, polycythemia, sleep apnea, insulin resistance, chronic pelvic pain, and increased cancer and stroke risk. These two are actually shocking how much increased cancer and stroke risk there is from taking um, taking uh, 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 hormone blockers and that type of thing. It, it's, it's really shocking, way more than you would think, and ha definitely has a lot of doctors going, but why? So expect research about that to come out in 10 to 15 years. All right. While the spike in these procedures is relatively recent development, sterilization of minors and other vulnerable populations without clear consent is not a new phenomenon and has an unsettling history. Historically weaponized against minorities, sterilization, sterilization procedures have harmed many vulnerable populations, such as African Americans, female minors, the disabled, and others. Yes, this is true. Is this the same kind of situation? Mm, I don't think so. Although, okay, because here's the thing. So I'm thinking like a 16-year-old. A 16-year-old I might think is an idiot at making long-term decisions, but I think is coherent enough to make decisions that we should, like, not necessarily listen to, but, like, consider, like, maybe you actually are you know, competent enough to make decisions, um, at least have input. A six-year-old, probably not. All right. These violations have been found to infringe upon fundamental human right to procreate. Any discussion of sterilization procedures in context of minor children must accordingly consider the fundamental right that is at stake, the right to procreate. Okay, so I do get that you... The right to procreate. That's such a weird and messy idea that I think is real in many ways and also not what we're talking about here at all. But somehow also kind of... Anyway, given the uniquely vulnerable nature of children and the clear dangers of sterilization demonstrated throughout history... It is important to emphasize the crux of your question you present today. Whether facilitating parents and counselors or conducting doctors, medical procedures, and treatments that could permanently deprive minor children of their constitutional right to procreate, that I'm not sure it's a constitutional, well, because under the, we're getting bogged down. It would be built under the same thing as the right to privacy, uh, constitutional right to privacy, which falls under some, basically, the, the notion that anything, any traditional rights that are not enumerated in the Constitution are still given to you under the Constitution, and 
The right to privacy is basically what ultimately led to Roe versus Wade uh, being found in in favor of Roe. And uh, yeah, so there is there is legal argument there. But yeah, no, it just keeps throwing me for a loop as I keep thinking through the levels of it. All right. Uh, before those children have the legal capacity to consent to those procedures or treatments constitutes child abuse. The medical evidence does not demonstrate that children and adolescents benefit from engaging in those irreversible sterilization procedures. Um, yeah, actually. So how do I put this? The... Uh, the statistically, so it, it's a matter of statistics versus the individual. Uh, it's very possible that the individual may benefit from it. Statistically, across outcomes, across you know, from from what we have studied so far, uh, we don't actually see demonstrable, statistically significant, like. Well, maybe not statistically significant, but we don't see considerable improvement from a lot of these procedures, um, depending on when they were gotten. The younger the the younger they were given, the less benefit we see. So, like, there's more like um, decrease in suicide from people who received it at eighteen to twenty, and like no real <laughs> no real uh move on the suicide numbers for people who got it from the ages of like 12 to 14. all right i those numbers i don't have like those age numbers i don't have memorized so i might have the numbers slightly wrong for what like what ages but from what i remember the younger it's given the less benefit to basically no benefit. We see. The prevalence of gender dysphoria in children and adolescents has never been estimated, and there's no scientific consensus that these sterilizing procedures and treatments even serve to benefit minor children dealing with gender dysphoria. Uh, there's not a consensus, no. There are, there's, there's a lively debate. There's a lively debate. This is where I was mentioning both in Europe and in this country. There's a very lively debate about this. Um, the other challenge is that all, how many children grow out of gender dysphoria. Um, so it, or, or, and how many people who received a transition procedure as a minor and then regretted it later. So that's a, you know, and actually some of them quasi transition back. So that's a very hard thing. And there's not, the science needle does not point one way or another as to the best way of handling all of this. As stated by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, there is not enough high quality evidence to determine whether gender reassignment surgery improves health outcomes for Medicare beneficiaries with gender dysphoria, and whether patients most likely to benefit from these types of surgical interventions can be identified prospectively. That means identified without doing them, without doing the surgeries. Uh, all right. Also, quote, several studies show a higher rate of regret at being sterilized among younger women than, amend the, than among those who were sterilized at a later age. Hey, I was just talking about that. Yeah, so, and that's federal regulations that they're talking there. This further indicates that minor children are not sufficiently mature to make informed decisions in this context. There is no evidence that long-term mental health outcomes are improved or the rates of suicide are reduced by hormonal or sur surgical intervention. Excuse me. Childhood onset gender dysphoria has been shown, quote, childhood onset gender dysphoria has been shown to have a high rate of natural resolution 
with 61 to 98 percent of children re-identifying with their biological sex during puberty. No studies to date have evaluated the natural course and rate of gender dysphoria resolution among the novel cohort presenting with adolescent onset gender dysphoria. Okay, so this is saying that if you have that, that childhood gender dysphoria, so prepubescent gender dysphoria, has a resolution rate of somewhere between 61 and 98 percent once you actually get your puberty. You know, once you start actually, your body starts really doing the differentiation that doesn't really happen pre-puberty. It doesn't happen substantially pre-puberty. Uh, and we don't have anything on the second one. Or on, on the post, on the adolescent onset where you already have your hormones going and then you're like, mm, I don't know about this. We don't have studies about the natural course and rate of resolution there. Which makes sense because this is kind of a very recent like focus. So, all right. One of the few relevant studies monitored transitioned individuals for 30 years. That's a pretty long study. It found high rates of post-transition suicide and significantly elevated all-cause mortality, including increased death rates from cardiovascular disease and cancer, although causality could not be established. The lack of evidence in this field is why the Senator Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services rejected a nationwide coverage mandate for adult gender transition surgeries during the Obama administration. Um, something that's very important to remember here when you're dealing with medical ethics is the first, uh, the first rule is do no harm. So if you can't be sure that you're actually doing medical good, but you know you're probably doing medical bad, you probably don't want to do it. Which is why the center Centers of Medicare and Medicaid, they tried to balance those things and they said, there's not enough good here to outweigh the potential bad, so we're not going to pay for it. Um, individual doctors, obviously, are making those judgments differently. Similarly, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health states that with respect to irreversible procedures, genital surgery should not be carried out until patients reach the legal age of majority to give consent for medical procedures in a given country. I didn't know about that. I didn't know about that. So that, I mean, the irreversible procedures part makes sense to me. Um, yeah. Anyway. Generally, the age of majority is 18 in Texas. With respect to consent to sterilization procedures, Medicaid sets the age threshold even higher at 21 years old. Children and adolescents are promised relief and asked to, to quote, consent to life-altering irreversible treatment, and to do so in the midst of reported psychological distress when they cannot weigh long-term risks the way the adults do, way adults do, and when they are considered by the state in most regards to be without the legal capacity to consent, contract, vote, or otherwise. Legal and ethics scholars have suggested that it is particularly unethical and to radically intervene in the normal physical development of a child to affirm a gender identity that is at odds with the bodily sex. So, I mean, that is a very good point, is that we, we don't... <laughs> we don't treat children, you know, people under the 18, like they can consent to a lot of things. Um, that's interesting. State and federal governments have wide discretion, quote, wide discretion to pass legislation in areas where there is medical or scientific uncertainty. Gonzalez versus Carhartt, 550 U.S. Thus, states routinely regulate the medical profession and routinely update the regu regulations as new trends arise and new evidence becomes available. In the opioid context, for instance, states responding to an epidemic caused largely by pharmaceutical companies and medical professionals, dismissing as opioid phobic any concern that, quote, raising pain treatment to a patient's rights issue could lead to 
and over-reliance on opioids, these experts created new pain standards and assured doctors that prescribing more opioids was largely risk-free. As we know now, the results were, indeed, are nothing short of tragic. There is always the potential for novel medicational, novel medical determinations to promote purport, purported remedies that may not improve patient outcomes and can even result in tragic harms. The same potential for harm exists for minors who have engaged in the type of procedures or treatments above. The state's power is arguably at its zenith when it comes to protecting children. Yeah, that's true. In the Supreme Court's words, that is due to the particular or peculiar vulnerability of children. The Supreme Court, uh, let's see, the state, quote, the state has an independent interest in the well-being of its youth. The Supreme Court has explained that children's, quote, inability to make critical decisions in an informed, mature manner makes legislation to protect them, excuse me, particularly appropriate. The procedures that you ask about impose significant and irreversible effects on children, and we therefore address them with extreme caution, excuse me, mindful of the state's duty to protect its children. Children, by definition, are, quote, Children, by definition, are not assumed to have the capacity to take care of themselves. They are assumed to be subject to the control of their parents. If parental control falters, the state must play its part as parents patrie. In this respect, the child's liberty interest may, in appropriate circumstances, be subordinated to the state's parents patrie interest in preserving and promoting the welfare of the child. End quote. All right, what page are we on? Five of 13. Wow, this is a long one. To the extent that these procedures and treatments could result in sterilization, they would deprive the child of the fundamental right to procreate, which supports a find, finding the child abuse under the family code. See, that's just weird to me. Like, you had all this stuff about it not being, potentially not being, um, re like, able to f children might not be able to consent like which you know i could see there being arguments about you had all this stuff about um thing then we go we always go back to this fundamental right to procreate anyway surgical and chemical procedures you ask about can and do cause sterilization yeah similarly Treatments you ask about often involve puberty blocking medications. Such medications suppress the body's natural or production of estrogen and testosterone to prevent puberty and are used in this context to pause the sexual development of a person that occurs during puberty. The use of these chemical procedures for this purpose is not approved by the Federal Food and Drug Administration and is often considered off label use of medications. I mean, a lot of things are considered off-label use of medications that are very useful. So, anyway, these chemicals, these chemical procedures prevent a person's body from developing the capacity to procreate. There is insufficient medical evidence available to demonstrate that discontinuing the medication resumes a normal puberty process. Yeah, that is true. There's, there's some questions about, like, you get back kind of on track, but not really. It, it, it's weird. The body is weird. Uh, referring to Bell's conclusion that clinics practice of prescribing puberty suppressant medications to individuals under 18 with gender dysphoria and determining that such a treatment was experimental. Okay, so that's a that's a thing. Thus, because the procedure you inquire about can and do result in sterilization, they implicate a minor they implicate a minor's child's constitutional right to procreate that is interesting i didn't realize that even as recently as december 1st 2020 um the use of these things uh, of these gender of these gender of these uh hormone blockers was still considered experimental an experimental use it means that they don't have enough evidence yet to determine full safety all right. The United States court recognizes the right to procreate its fundamental right under the 14th Amendment. See Skinner versus Oklahoma. 
Almost a century ago, the court explained the unique concerns sterilization poses, poses respecting this fundamental right. The power to sterilize, if exercised, may have subtle, far-reaching, and devastating effects. In evil or reckless hands, it can cause races or types in which are inimical to the dominant group to wither and disappear. There is no redemption for the individual whom the law touches. Any experiment which the state conducts is to his irreparable injury. He is forever deprived of a basic liberty. Oh, huh. I guess there really is. Well, there we go. I didn't realize that the state, that the U.S. Supreme Court really did hit so hard on the fundamental right to uh, be able to procreate. I learned something new here. To the extent the procedures you describe cause permanent damage to reproductive organs and the functions of a child before the child has the legal capacity con to consent, they unlawfully violate the child's constitutional right to procreate. Um, see generally federal regulation such and such discussing ripeness for coercion and regret rates among minor, minor children. Under Texas law, a minor is a person under the 18 years of age that has never been married and never been declared an adult by the court. Okay, so if you've been married or um, you, there's, you know, you've been emancipated, basically. And that includes a minor on active duty in the military, one who does not live with a parent and guardian and manages their own financial affairs, among others. So if you're emancipated, they're saying you've demonstrated the ability to be considered legally competent. Okay. State law recognizes seven instances in which a minor can consent to certain types of medical treatment on their own. None of the express provisions relating to a minor's ability to consent to treat to medical treatment address the consent to the procedures used for gender affirming treatment. The lack of authority of a minor to consent to an irreversible sterilization procedure is consistent with other law. Federal Medicaid program does not allow for parental consent and has established a minimum age of 21 for consent to sterilization procedures and imposes detailed requirements for obtaining that consent. Federal Medicaid funds may not be used for sterilization without complying with the consent requirements, meaning a doctor may not be reimbursed for sterilization procedures performed on minors. The higher age for sterilization procedures was implemented due to a number of special concerns, including historical instances of forced sterilization. Minors and other incompetents have been sterilized with federal funds. Quote, minors and other incompetents have been sterilized with federal funds and an indefinite number of poor people have been improperly coerced into accepting a sterilization under the threat of that various federally supported welfare benefits would be withdrawn unless they submitted to an irreversible sterilization. In addition, the 21-year minimum age of consent rule accounted for concerns that minors were more susceptible to coercion than those over 21 and that younger and that younger women had higher rates of regret for sterilization than those who were sterilized at a later age. Uh, see federal regulation pointing to comments suggesting that persons under 21 are more susceptible to coercion than over 21 and are more likely to lack the maturity to make an informed decision, and acknowledging that, quote, these considerations favor protecting such individuals by limiting their access to the procedure, and pointing to several studies showing that a higher rate of regret um, at being sterilized among younger women than among those who are sterilized at a later age. Whew. Okay. Regarding parental consent, Texas law generally recon recognizes a parent's right to consent to a, to a child's medical care. Okay, so now we're getting to the point where why doesn't a parent's consent equate to their being consent? Uh, quoting Texas Family Code, quote, A parent of a child has the following rights and duties. The right to consent to a child's medical and dental care, psychiatric, psychological, and surgical treatments. End quote. But this general right to consent to certain medically necessary procedures does not extend to elective, quote, you know, parents not medically necessary procedures and treatments that infringe upon a minor child's constitutional right to procreate. 
Indeed, courts have analyzed the imposition of unnecessary medical procedures upon children in similar circumstances in the past to determine whether doing so constitutes child abuse. One such situation that the law has addressed is often referred to as Munchausen by proxy or factitious disorder imposed on another. A psychological disorder that is characterized by the intentional feigning, exaggeration, or induction of symptoms of a disease or injury in oneself or another, and that is accompanied by seeking excessive medical care from various doctors and medical facilities typically resulting in multiple diagnostic tests, treatments, procedures, and hospitalizations. Unlike the malingerer, who consciously induces symptoms to obtain something of value, the patient with a fractitious disorder consciously produces symptoms for unconscious reasons without identifiable gain. Munchausen syndrome is very interesting. Um, it's a psychological disorder where, you know, you you try to make yourself sick because you want to be taken care of, but you don't realize you're doing it necessarily, or you don't, there, there, it's a, it's a pathological need. And then doing that to your child, yeah, that makes sense. It's child abuse. Absolutely. Both making them sick and then making them get procedures and medications and poked and prodded for things that you're doing to them. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, in situations such as this, the individual intentionally seeks to procure, often by deceptive means, such as exaggeration, unnecessary medical procedures or treatments either for themselves or others, usually their children. In Texas, courts have found that these Munchausen by proxy situations can constitute child abuse. Uh, see this, quote, recognizing an unnecessary medical procedure may cause serious bodily injury, supporting a charge of injury to a child under the penal code. Yeah, that makes sense. Ooh. All right, I need to set this on the In the context of elective sex change procedures for minors, the legislature has not provided any avenue for parental consent, and no judicial avenue exists for the child to proceed with these procedures and treatments without parental consent. Okay, so the state hasn't given parents the ability to consent, and there's no way for the kids to sue to be allowed to do it without their parents. By comparison, Texas state law respecting abortion requires parental consent and in extenuating circumstances permits non-parental consent for a minor to obtain an abortion. Uh, the code's relevant, but the Texas legislature has not decided to make those the same to make those same allowances for consent to sterilization and thus a parent cannot consent to sterilization procedures or treatments that result in permanent deprivation of a minor child's constitutional right to procreate. Thus, no avenue exists for a child to consent to or obtain consent for an elective procedure or treatment that causes sterilization. Procedures and treatments you describe can constitute child abuse under the Family Code. Having established legal and cultural context of this opinion request, we now consider whether these procedures and treatments qualify as child abuse under the family code, where as a factual matter, one of these procedures or treatments cannot result in sterilization. A court would have to go through the process of evaluating on a case-by-case -case basis whether that procedure violates any provisions of the family code, whether the procedure or treatment poses a similar threat or likelihood of substantial physical and emotional harm. Thus, where a factual scenario involving non-medically necessary gender-based procedures or treatments on a minor causes or threatens to harm or irreparably harm, causes harm or irreparable harm to the child, compared to instances of Munchausen syndrome by proxy or criminal injury to a child, or demonstrates a lack of consent, a court could find such procedures to constitute child abuse. The Texas legislature defines child abuse broadly. One second, I just need to blow my nose. Ah, there we go. I was forming a seal of mucus. Uh, the family code provides 
for the reporting and investigation of abuse or neglect of a child. It defines abuse through a broad and non-exclusive list of actions and omissions. Of course, this broad definition of abuse would apply to and include criminal acts against a child, such as female genital mutilation or injury to a child. Your questions implicate several components of section things. Subsection identifies, quote, mental or emotional injury to a child that results in, in an observable and material impairment in the child's growth, development, or psychological functioning. Uh, subsection provides that, quote, causing or permitting the child to be in a situation in which the child sustains mental or emotional injury that results in an observable and material impairment to the child's growth, development, psychological functioning is abuse. Subsection blanks includes as abuse a, quote, physical injury that results in substantial harm to the child or the genuine threat of substantial harm from physical injury to the child. And subsection that includes, quote, failure to make a reasonable effort to prevent a child by another person, to prevent an action by another person that results in physical injury that results in substantial harm to a child. Offering some clarity to the scope of abuse under subsection blank, the Texas Department of Family Protective Services adopted rules giving meaning to key terms and phrases used in the definition. The department acknowledges that emotional abuse is a subset of abuse that includes, quote, mental or emotional injury to a child that results in an observable material impairment in the child's growth, development, or psychological functioning. Uh, I see that. Um, department's rules provide that mental or emotional injury means, quote, uh, that a child of any age experiences significant or serious negative effects on the intellectual or psychological development or functioning, exhibits behaviors indicative of the observed material impairment, meaning discernible, substantial damage or deterioration to a child's emotional, social, or cognitive development. With respect to physical injuries, the department further clarified that this means that the meaning of the phrase physical injury that results in substantial harm to a child, explaining that it means relevant it, explaining that it means in relevant part a quote real and significant injury real and significant physical injury or damage to a child that includes but is not limited to any of the following if caused by an action of of the alleged perpetrator directed toward the alleged victim impairment and or injury impairment of or injury to any bodily organ or function end quote the department's rules also define a genuine threat of substantial harm from physical injury to include declaring or exhibiting the intent to or determination to inflict real significant physical injury or damage to a child. I just realized that I've been basically straight reading a lot of this, but that's because I find it to be very plainly written. Um, we'll, we'll do some what does it all mean at the bottom. Uh, subsection blank, and these rules define abuse broadly to include mental or emotional injury in addition to a physical injury. To the extent the specific procedures about which you ask may cause mental or emotional injury or physical injury within these provisions, they constitute abuse. Further, the legislature has explicitly defined female genital mutilation and made such act a state jail uh, felony. While the legislature has not defined a phrase, the phrase genital mutilation, nor specifically for males of any age, the legislature's criminalization of a particular type of genital mutilation supports an argument that analogous procedures that include genital mutilation, including potentially gender reassignment surgeries, could constitute abuse under the Family Code's broad, non-exhaustive examples of child abuse or neglect. Uh, thus, Many of the procedures and treatments you ask about can constitute gen female genital mutilation as a standalone, a standalone criminal act. But even where these procedures and treatments may not can constitute female genital mutilation under Texas law, a court could still find these procedures and treatments constitute child abuse under thing. Each of these procedures and treatments can constitute child abuse. Family Texas Code is clear. 
causing or permitting substantial harm to a child or child's growth and development is child abuse. Courts have held that an unnecessary surgical procedure that removes a healthy body part from a child can constitute a real and significant injury or damage to the child. Uh, recognizing, you know, see this, recognizing that an unnecessary medical procedure may cause serious bodily injury, supporting a charge of injury to a child. Uh, the Williamson case involved a victim of medical child abuse, sometimes referred to Munchausen syndrome by proxy. <sighs> Munchausen syndrome by proxy is where a alleged perpetrator attempts to gain medical procedures and, and issues for their child for secondary gain for themselves. As a result, the children are subjected to multiple diagnostic tests, therapeutic procedures, sometimes operative procedures, in order to treat things that aren't really there. In Williamson's case, the abuse was perpetrated on a child when he was five or six years old by his mother. The evidence shows that two surgeries performed on the child were not medically necessary and that his mother knowingly and intentionally caused the unnecessary procedures to be performed by fabricating, exaggerating, and inducing symptoms leading to the surgeries. Okay. Similarly, in Austin v. State, a court of appeals upheld a conviction for a felony injury of a child of a mother suffering from Munchausen syndrome by proxy who injected her son with insulin. Uh, we're just going to skip a bunch of that. Finding that the mother neglected her son by subjecting him to a continuous course of medical treatment for a condition which he did not have, and he was a neglected child under the state statute governing abuse of a child. In guidance documents published for the Child Protective Service attorneys, the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services explained that Munchausen by proxy syndrome is relatively rare, but when it occurs is frequently a basis for finding child abuse. Whether motivated by Munchausen syndrome by proxy or otherwise, it is clear that unnecessary medical treatment inflicted on a child by a parent can constitute child abuse under the family code. By definition, procedures and treatments resulting in sterilization cause physical injury that result in substantial harm to the child, genuine threat of substantial harm from physical injury to the child. By surgically altering key physical parts of the child in ways that render entire body parts, organs, and the entire reproductive system of the child physically incapable of functioning. Thus, procedures and treatments can constitute child abuse. Even where the procedure or treatment does not involve the physical removal or alteration of a child's reproductive organs, i.e. puberty blockers, these procedures and treatments can cause mental or emotional injury to a child that results in an observable and material impairment in the child's growth, development, psychological functioning. By subjecting a child to mental emotional injury with lifelong sterilization, an impairment to one's growth or development. Uh, oh, that was the end of the sentence. <laughs> Therefore... A court could find that these procedures and treatments to be child abuse. Further, further, attempts by a parent to consent to these procedures and treatments on behalf of their child may, if successful, cause a permanent cause or permit the child to be in a situation in which the child sustains a mental or emotional injury that results in an observable and material impairment in the child's growth development or psychological functioning, uh, and could be child abuse under sections those sections. Additionally, the failure to stop a child or another parent from conducting these treatments and procedures on a minor child can constitute a failure to make a reasonable effort to prevent a child, to prevent an action by another person that results in a physical injury that results in substantial harm to the child. And if this failure to make a reasonable effort to prevent can also can, and this re failure to make a reasonable effort to prevent can also constitute child abuse under section any person that conducts or facilitates procedures or treatments that could be that could be engaged in child abuse, whether parents, doctors, counselors, whatever. All right, last paragraph. Oh, reading sard. It is important to note that anyone who has a, quote, reasonable cause to believe that a child's physical or mental health or welfare has been adversely affected by abuse or neglect by any person shall immediately make a report, end quote as described by the Family Code. Further, quote, if a professional has a reasonable cause to believe a child has been abused or neglected, or may be ne abused or neglected, or if that child is a victim of an offense under section, the professional has reasonable cause 
and the professional has reasonable cause to believe that the child has been abused as defined by section the professional shall make a report no later than the 48th hour after the hour the professional first has reasonable cause to believe the child has been or may be abused or neglected or is a victim of an offense under section the term includes teachers nurses doctors daycare employees employees of a clinic or healthcare facility that provides reproductive services juvenile probation officers juvenile detention or correctional officers a failure to report these circumstances is a criminal offense. Summary. Each of these sex change procedures and treatments enumerated above when performed on children can legally constitute child abuse under several provisions of the Family Code. When considering the questions of child abuse, a court would likely consider the fundamental right to procreation, issues of physical and emotional harm associated with these procedures and treatments, consent laws in Texas, and throughout the country, and existing child abuse standards. Very truly yours, Ken Paxton. Whew. Okay, that was a lot of reading. Number one thing, I think most people just read this. Just read this page and said, uh, I know enough. Um, number two, what he was doing in that 13-page document was not he didn't decide that gender reassignment treatments were child abuse. He was asked by the legislature to weigh in on if on, on that specific question on whether those would constitute child abuse. He then took the totality of Texas state law and federal law and attempted to make a judgment based on those whether or not they stated that under those under that constellation of laws whether it would constitute child abuse um and then that this letter can be used as the blueprint then if you wanted to uh prosecute so his I mean, he, he is an attorney. I am not. His argument for how Texas Family Code describes things, if you view gender reassignment treatment as elective, makes total sense to me. If you view it as non-elective, well then, this doesn't apply. And he actually specifically, at the beginning, remember, outlined that medically necessary treatments of these types would not be considered child abuse because they're medically necessary. So then it comes down to what is medically necessary. That's, that's an important thing to remember, is that he isn't making law here. He really is just trying to interpret what the law of Texas says. And I think he did a very exhaustive job of it. <laughs> um, exhausting for me at least um yeah okay the other thing is is that he pointed out and this is actually tied into some of the stuff about western europe uh so western europe right now in northern europe this is happening i think in mostly in france england sweden norway are, are where these debates are happening so they were all those countries were much quicker to allow sex reassignment surgeries left and right and, and center and just just not quite free for all because i mean you know still medical procedures but as close to a free for all for medical procedures as you can get and now they are actually saying hold up we went too far and they're actually walking backwards they're um they're walking it back because from their perspectives they there, there's a lot of surgeries happening that are not providing benefit to the children. Well, not just as children, but not providing benefit to the people over the long term. Um, there's a lot of pushback with that back and forth. Um, there's a, a growing number of, of groups in this country, or a growing group in this country, of um, 
people who had gender reassignment surgery at a fairly young age, uh, think younger than 20, and then uh, transitioned back later. And a lot of them talk about the fact that they, this is not having been anything near the position myself, I find this very interesting is um, some of them talk about how they were young and so like so if a lady liked ladies and in talking to specific psych psychiatric you know help she wasn't dealing with the fact that she was a lesbian and her doctors kind of pushed her along towards reassignment because they felt that she was a man in a woman's body so she went through all the reassignment surgery and all of that and then later decided no i'm a woman i just like women um so i mean it's it's, it's fantastically complicated and you know i don't think the doctors are doing this in bad faith but uh there's definitely i think a, a good number of doctors who are too gung-ho on this um the uh another thing is that the ooh, i can't remember which it's not the biggest one but i think it's the second biggest one the american pediatric association something along those lines the second i think it's the second biggest um association professional association of pediatricians um actually they're more hardcore than than this they're like no anything any kind of treatment before the age of 13 should just minus the medically necessary you know uh, uh things uh should be considered just child abuse straight up even puberty blockers um they're a lot yeah you know, they're a lot harder on that but you know they're doctors they're not it's not just a lawyer you know saying this they're they're pediatricians um yeah so the there's a lot of about this that the science not only is i hate the phrase settled science i hate the phrase settled science but not only is the science not finding a level it's not even i i wouldn't even say at this point that you could point to a, prepon, a preponderance of evidence that would guide you in these in in how to apply these situations so it's fantastically complicated especially the wider view you take if you're following the developments um in the in the treatment community in europe um who like i said they're they're they they kind of went through the same waves we did but they're just they did it a little earlier and so they and they went to they've decided they've gone too far and they're trying to pull back a bit um It'll be interesting to see where they pull back to, if if they pull back farther than we go, and then we have to pull back. And anyway, so I hope that provided context. I feel like I did a much, I had a much more of a job, and I did a good job explaining the, what was going on in the Florida law. Here, I think I mostly read, but I think I provided a little bit of context for you. Um, yeah, that was that was a lot of reading. I was happy to do it. And yeah, I'll I'll catch you guys next time. Send me more questions. All right. Bye-bye.